So today we're going to start our new unit on magnetism, which is much like electricity in some ways, but different than electricity in other ways. We're going to talk about magnetic fields, just like we talked about electric fields and gravitational fields. We're going to talk about magnetic forces and effects of magnetic fields on charges, just like we talked about electric forces and effects of electric fields on charges and so on. A lot of similarities. Okay, a lot of things that we're going to draw parallels between electricity and magnetism. But what I want you to remember, first and foremost here, is that electricity is not magnetism, and magnetism is not electricity. When we're talking about magnetic fields and magnetic forces, it's not the same thing. When we're talking about north poles and south poles, it's not the same thing as positive charges and negative charges. Okay, there are similarities. There are a lot of similarities, but they're different. Okay, now, you guys did really well on your unit test, on your electricity unit test. You guys understand electric fields for the most part, what, uh, what they do to electric charges, which way they point, the shapes of them, and so on and so on and so on. You will understand magnetic fields as well. You won't have any more problem with magnetic fields than you have with electric fields. But when you start seeing them together, electric fields and magnetic fields, that's when it seems to create a few problems for us. So I want you to, as I said yesterday, keep in the back of your mind all the time here, when we're looking at magnetic fields, okay, this is a magnetic field. What would this do if it was an electric field? What effect would it have if it's an electric field? Okay, if we think about that as we're going through magnetic fields, then I think we're less likely to make a mistake and get confused when we see the two together. All right? We talked a little bit yesterday about this, but we'll spend uh, a little bit more time on this today. We'll treat it as if we hadn't looked at it at all yesterday. A magnetic domain is the first thing that we need to define here in our magnetism unit because that's the basis behind everything magnetism. A magnetic domain is a tiny little region inside a ferromagnetic material that we represent by arrows. We're not suggesting that these tiny little regions are arrows. If we take a look at this ferromagnetic material, whatever that is, under a microscope, we're not going to see tiny little arrows. We simply represent something with tiny little arrows. The ferromagnetic material has these domains, which are really just regions of common spins of electrons, okay? similarities between the spins of electrons. When we have these regions that have these similarities, we have to represent it somehow. We're not going to draw a bunch of electrons spinning okay, on our piece of paper. We're going to draw it as arrows. It's a lot easier to represent it with arrows than it is with actually drawing electrons spinning in certain, in certain patterns. You guys don't need to know the details the fundamental aspects of what a domain is, you guys need to know that it's some kind of tiny little region inside a ferromagnetic material that we can show or that we can represent with these arrows. But in order to really understand that, we've got to know what a ferromagnetic material is. Who can tell me what a ferromagnetic material is? Good. It's something that can become magnetized. In other words, it doesn't have a North Pole and a South Pole right now, but it can develop a North Pole and a South Pole given the right circumstances. Now, there's a couple of circumstances that can cause this non-magnetized ferromagnetic material to become a magnet, to have a North Pole and a South Pole. The first way is to bring another magnet nearby and watch the effect that it has. Okay, this magnet that we bring nearby has domains that are pointing in the same direction. That's a magnet. Okay, that's a ferromagnetic material that is magnetized. It's a piece of steel or it's a piece of iron that is a magnet. It has a North Pole and a South Pole. When I bring that nearby, or if I rub it against it, okay, or if I touch it against it, then I'm going to cause the domains that are aligned, the domains that are pointing in the same direction, to affect the domains in the other material, the non-magnetized material, to also start pointing at least more or less in the same direction. So instead of looking like it just did, it's going to start looking like this. 
These domains are pointing in the same direction now. Now we have not just a ferromagnetic material, a piece of steel, a piece of iron, whatever. We have a magnet with a north pole and a south pole. Now, which end is the North Pole and which end is the South Pole? Well, we arbitrarily define the North Pole as the way the domains point. So this would be the North Pole of this magnet, and this would be the South Pole. The domains will always point from south to north. What's going to happen, just out of curiosity, if I cut this magnet in half, Let's say I literally take a hacksaw and cut it in half. Or I just, it's soft enough that I can break it in half. Okay, what's going to happen if I break it in half? It's already become magnetized, so let's take that other one away. Okay. Here's where I cut it in half, right there. What do we have now? A North Pole magnet and a South Pole magnet, right? Which way do domains point? What's the definition of the direction of the domains? from south to north. Okay, so if we have two magnets, both with domains in it, then the, the domains have got to point from south to north. That infers, just by that definition, that there's got to be a south pole and a north pole in each magnet. In other words, if I cut that in half, I'm not going to have a south magnet and a north magnet like it's labeled right now. I'm going to have two magnets, each with a south pole and a north pole. Does that make sense? Okay, if you take two magnets and put them together, they stick really well together. Okay, that's as if it's become one magnet with one north and one south. If we separate that, okay, we can do that. We've done that before. We separate those two magnets. Are they attracted to each other? Well, they're attracted to each other because there's a north pole and a south pole. Okay, that's exactly what happens if you cut one magnet in half. There's one of the first differences between electricity and magnetism. Can we have a single charge? A single, we call it a mono charge, a positive or a negative charge without the other. Can you have a positive producer? Sure. Can you have a negative producer? Sure. Do you have to have both at the same time? No. Do you have to have both poles at the same time? Yes. So we can have a mono charge, a single charge, positive or negative, but we can't have a monopole, a single pole, north or south. What's the other way, by the way? We talked about this briefly just as class was ending, I think, yesterday. Uh, the other way to produce a magnetic field or a magnetic effect in this non-magnetized ferromagnetic material, besides bringing another magnet nearby. Yep. Yeah, you guys have all done this probably in grade, I don't know, grade 5 or grade 6 or something. You wrap some wire around it and then hook it up to a battery or hook it up to some kind of power supply. That causes an electric current to go through that wire. That electric current generates a magnetic field, which we'll talk about in a lot more detail in the coming days. But bottom line is right now, trust me, it generates a magnetic field. That magnetic field will magnetize this non-magnetized ferromagnetic material. In other words, those domains that were pointing more or less in random directions are all going to start pointing in the same direction, or at least pretty close to the same direction, so that now we've got a magnet. You guys have seen this, right, a million times. You've probably done it in elementary school. Okay, if you haven't done it, you've seen it, right? Junkyards, okay, this is, you know, you watch Mighty Machines when you're a little kid, and uh, you see the, uh, the video on junkyards where, where this big, it's like a crane comes over and picks up these cars in the junkyard, but it doesn't clamp onto these cars. It picks them up by this massive magnet, okay, and then they flip a switch, and all of a sudden the car drops, right? It's exactly what's happening here. Okay? We have an electric current going through that wire. It generates a really strong magnetic field in that, in that crane. Okay? It picks up the car because it's a magnet now, and this car is made out of primarily out of steel. Okay? And then they flip off the switch. Once the current stops, what happens to those domains in that, in that piece of steel? They go back to the way they were. They go back to pointing in random directions. So the magnetic effect is now gone. It's still ferromagnetic. It still has the potential to become magnetized, but it's no longer a magnet. Right? Let's talk about three laws of magnetism. Here's we talked about one of the differences between electricity and magnetism. Let's talk about one of the similarities now. You guys remember the three laws of electricity. Opposite charges attract. Like charges repel. I'll talk about the third one in just a second. Okay, the first two laws of magnetism. 
like poles repel. So again, we're not talking about positive repels positive now. That was electricity. We're talking about north repels north or south repels south. Unlike poles of a magnet attract. So we're not talking about positive attracting negative anymore. We're talking about north attracting south. It's different, but yet it's the same. You remember in our electricity unit, there were a lot of similarities between electric fields and gravitational fields, electric forces and gravitational forces. We're just extending that to magnetism now. You guys remember what that third law of the electric charge was? Charged objects attract neutral objects. What do you think the third law of magnetism is? You're very close. Magnetized objects attract unmagnetized objects. What's wrong with that? He's very, very close, but what's wrong with it, Down? Good. Magnetized objects attract non-magnetized ferromagnetic objects. If you take a magnet and bring it near a piece of paper, it has no effect, right? Because a piece of paper isn't a ferromagnetic material. But if you take a magnet and you bring it near the leg of your desk, which is made out of steel, it's going to attract it because it's a magnet attracting a non-magnetized ferromagnetic material. Does anybody want to take a stab at why that actually happens? Okay, if I've got this, this object here that has domains pointing in random directions, and I bring a magnetized object nearby with the domains all pointing in the same direction, with, this would be a south pole, right? This would be a north pole. Does anybody want to suggest why it attracts the non-magnetized ferromagnetic material? Yeah? Yeah, it's like induction, right? It's not a temporary separation of charge like it was with electricity, but it's still induction. Okay, we're inducing these domains that we're pointing in random directions to temporarily point this way. So basically, the leg of your desk ends up becoming a magnet, a soft magnet, we call it, a temporary magnet, with a south pole and a north pole. The side that's closest to the magnet that was doing the magnetizing, that was trying to attract the leg of the desk, it's opposite. We know that opposite poles attract, south attracts north. So why does this third law work? It works because we're inducing a temporary magnetic effect in the non-magnetized material. That non-magnetized material becomes magnetized for a short time while this other object is nearby. And that's the reason why magnets that find nails very attractive. Because these things with the domains aligned already cause the domains in this thing to become aligned towards it already. It's that, it's that magnetism, okay? it's that sense of magnetism that, that, uh, that one thing is attracted to another, right? The domains become aligned temporarily, just like we could develop a temporary separation of charge with electricity. All right, we talked about gravitational fields. We talked about electric fields. We're going to now talk about magnetic fields. Everybody has in front of them right now a piece of paper that has three diagrams, all of which looks something like this. Okay, the thing in the middle, of course, represents a magnet. And you can see the polarity of that magnet, North Pole and a South Pole. And then you can see a bunch of stars that surround it. I'm going to give you guys uh, two magnets. Uh, each group of you guys is going to get two magnets and a compass. What I want you to do is to place the magnet on your desk okay, in the orientation that you see on the, on the board right now or on the paper that you have in front of you right now. Okay, you can't place it literally right on top of the paper because the diagram that's on the paper is smaller than the actual magnet. So you're going to have to just kind of use it to represent where the magnet goes and where the compass goes. These stars are going to represent where the compass goes. Okay, I want you to place, okay, if you see diagram number one on your paper in front of you right now, I want you to place the compass in various positions around the magnet, those positions that are represented by these stars. So right above the magnet, for instance, okay, I want you to put the compass right here. I want you to see which way the needle points. Okay, and I want you to draw an arrow representing which way the needle points. So if it's right here, the needle is pointing to the right, then I want you to draw a really, really short arrow pointing to the right. Okay, if right here it's pointing 
to the left, okay, then I want you to draw a really, really short arrow pointing to the left. Okay, don't make them long arrows. Okay? It's hard enough to see what we want to see even with short arrows. If you make them long arrows, you're never going to see anything that we want to see. Okay? So you're going to take your magnets. Okay, you're going to put them in the orientation that you see on the template that you have in front of you right now. And then you're going to put your compass in various spots around okay, that, uh, that uh, magnet. And you're going to draw little arrows representing which way the compass points when it's placed in those various points around the magnet. Does that make sense? Once you have those arrows drawn, as a class, we'll start trying to join some lines together. Start trying to do a little bit of kindergarten, join the points, and see if we can get a diagram that looks somewhat recognizable like we did back in kindergarten. Okay? All right, guys. Everybody's had a chance to do their little activity now and determine which way the compass is pointing in various spots around these scenarios of magnets here. Let's draw uh, not all of the little arrows that you guys found, but Let's draw some of them to see what pattern we should have at least started seeing, at least hopefully started seeing here. Um, you guys would have found in the first diagram, okay, or in the first uh, setup where we had just a single north pole and a single south pole, uh, the compass should have been pointing something like this. Okay, it may not have been perfect, okay, but it should have been pointing uh, more or less at least like this. Do you guys see a pattern that looks something like this? How many people saw something that looked more or less like that? Okay, let's start joining some points together here, okay? Okay, as if it was kindergarten or grade one and we were and we were joining the dots together to try to form that picture of the elephant or whatever it is that it's supposed to see. Okay, if we start joining things together that looks like they should be joined together, okay, then our pattern starts looking like this. We have now a magnetic field that surrounds a bar magnet, a magnetic field that surrounds a north pole and a south pole of a bar magnet. And you can see which way the magnetic field points. You see it points from north to south there. Okay, we have our arrows already drawn for the direction of the magnetic field. Now, you don't have to draw this next diagram if you don't want. Okay, I just want to draw it to compare it with electric fields. If I do a positive charge rate here, in a negative charge right here, then the electric field that surrounded this positive and negative charge would look something like this. Do they not look a lot alike? They do. In fact, the shape of the magnetic field surrounding a north pole and a south pole is exactly like the shape of the electric field that surrounds a positive and a negative, except that we have this one more field line right in the middle here because we don't have any physical thing to take that space, right, like we have with the magnets up here. It's the same shape. We're not going to see a magnetic field surrounding a simple north or a simple south like we saw with the electric fields, because you can't have just a north or a south in the electric field and magnetic fields. Okay, where we can with with electric fields. You're all the simplest you're going to see is this positive and negative or north and south pole. Let's take a look at the next one here now. This one looks a little bit more complicated, but in the end, uh, same basic principles apply here. Let's draw some of the arrows, not all of them necessarily, but okay, we should have saw something like this. Do you guys see a pattern starting to form like that? Do your arrows look more or less like that? Well, if we start connecting the dots, it's going to look something like this. Oops. It's going to look something like this, where we have a little bit of a crazy pattern of magnetic fields here. Okay, we're drawing a couple more in there that we don't really have arrows for, but you can see that it would look like that if we did. I don't know if that reminds you of anything, but if we start drawing charges again, positive charge, negative charge, 
a positive charge and a negative charge, then we're going to start seeing an electric field that looks remarkably like that. Okay, we have an electric field that goes between the positive and the negative. Between the positive and the negative. And between the positive and the negative again. Again, the electric field surrounding a positive, negative, positive, negative looks an awful lot like the magnetic field that surrounds a north, south, north, and a south or the second simplest diagram that we can see. You could probably predict, even without your diagrams in front of you right now, what it was going to look like surrounding this scenario, where we have a north and a north against each other. Well, let's pretend for a second that we have a negative and a positive, a positive and a negative. What does the electric field look like surrounding that? Wrong direction there. The electric field looks like this. Right? I ring a bell? I mean, we never drew a diagram where we had four charges together. We do it where we had a positive and a negative like this, or a positive and a positive like this. But if we combine those diagrams, that's what it would look like. Let's draw the magnetic field now surrounding the south-north, north north-south. It's going to look something like this. With the arrows, the magnetic fields pointing away from the north and toward the south, just like they have in the rest of the diagrams. So again, once more, we see that similarity between electric fields and magnetic fields. Okay, the fields surrounding charges versus the fields surrounding poles, north poles and south poles. Does that make sense? You will on your next unit test, see some of these, one of these diagrams. Just like you did on your last unit test with the electric field diagrams, question number one, you will see magnetic field diagrams on your next unit test, I promise. On your diploma exam, you will, I can't promise anything on your diploma exam because I don't make it up and I don't even get to see it, in fact, until after you see it. But I can almost promise, as close as I I can promise as close as I possibly can to promise that you're going to see either electric field diagrams or magnetic field diagrams or both on your diploma exam. It's almost a certainty that you're going to see one or the other or both. Okay, and listen, when we see that, we've got to get that right. It's just diagrams. Okay, it's just remembering what these pictures look like. So we've got to make sure that we can get that right. All right, let's define the direction of magnetic field now. Just like we defined the direction of a gravitational field as the way that a mass would move if placed in the field, just like we defined the direction of the electric field as the way that a positive charge would move if placed in the field, we can define the direction of the magnetic field, this vector field, as the way that a compass needle points when placed in the field. That's the activity that you guys just did. You put a compass in the magnetic field, you saw which way it pointed. It pointed in the direction of the magnetic field, and that's what we drew as arrows. The way that a mass moves when placed in the field, gravity. The way that a positive charge moves when placed in the field, electric field. The way that a compass needle moves when placed in the field is the magnetic field. I say a compass needle, the compass needle really is the north end of a compass, right? That red tip of the compass needle is the north pole of the compass. Well, we also define the electric field as being away from positive and toward the negative. We can also define magnetic field as being away from the north and toward the south. So I told you at the beginning of this unit earlier today, and when we briefly addressed this yesterday, I said, when we talk about magnetic fields, I always want you to think about electric fields at the same time, and in your head, differentiate between them. 
Okay. Think about what an electric field would do when we have this magnetic field and so on and so on. Okay, let's take a look at, just for a second, a positive charge here. What kind of electric field would this positive charge produce? Well, one that goes out like this. What kind of magnetic field would this positive charge produce? What kind of magnetic field would this positive charge produce? It's a simple answer. None. It produces an electric field. Would it produce a gravitational field? It produces an electric field, clearly. Okay, no magnetic field. Would it produce a gravitational field? Yes? Yes? Brendan? How come? Good, because that has mass. So it produces a gravitational field that we haven't drawn there. It would point towards the producer because it has mass. Okay, it produces an electric field that's away from it because it's positive. It doesn't produce a magnetic field because it's not a magnet. It's a charge, not a magnet. Let's draw a magnetic field. Let's draw a magnetic field pointing toward the right. Okay. What could have caused that magnetic field? Well, maybe you got a magnet over here with uh, what pole would be over here? A north pole. Maybe you've got another magnet over here or another part of a magnet over here, which is a south pole. Maybe you've got one, maybe you've got the other, maybe you've got both of them. Okay, what if you had the same direction of field, but it was an electric field? What would have caused it? Well, there's a couple different possibilities, right? It could have been a big positive over here, or it could have been a big negative over here, or it could have been both, the positive and the negative. Okay, bottom line is, it's not the North Pole and the South Pole. Okay, with the magnets, the magnetic field, it's not the charges, it's the poles. With the electric field, it's not the poles, it's the charges. What would happen? What would happen to a positive charge if I put it right there? Which way would it go? Let's erase this. Okay, let's erase what caused it. We don't even need that, right? We just need the direction of the field. What would happen to a positive charge if I put it right there? It would move to the right. What would happen to a positive charge if I put it right there? It wouldn't be affected. It's a magnetic field versus an electric field. Okay, magnetic fields can affect charges, but not yet, not in the way that we've seen it to this point, okay? This positive would experience a force this way, to the right. This one would experience a force of zero. That make sense? What would happen if I put a little compass needle right there? Okay, which way would it point if I put a compass there? Compass would point to the right. What would happen if I put a compass right here? It would point to the in the Earth's magnetic field, right? It would point in a, a seemingly random direction. It wouldn't be affected whatsoever by this electric field. Make sense? So magnetic fields affect compass needles and non-magnetized ferromagnetic materials. Electric fields affect charges. Got it? Similarities, but yet the differences. Okay, be conscious of those as we as we go through this. All right, let's talk about the strength a little bit. You don't need to copy these down, okay? You don't need to memorize these numbers at all. I just want you to have a little bit of perspective here. First of all, magnetic field is given by the symbol B. Okay, just like electric field is given by the symbol E with the arrow over it, magnetic field is B with the arrow over it. And the units for magnetic field are Tesla, a capital T. The strength of the Earth's magnetic field varies, and it varies quite a bit, actually. But on average, it's somewhere in the range of 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. So it's a pretty weak magnetic field, 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. Okay, 0 0.00005, okay, 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. If we take a look at the average bar magnet, now you guys, when you did your activity a few minutes ago, used a weaker than average bar magnet. Okay, but it was still stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. How do you know that? How do you know the bar magnets you use produce a magnetic field that was stronger than the Earth's magnetic field? It affected the compass more than the Earth did, right? When you brought the compass nearby, the Earth's magnetic field didn't affect the compass anymore. Okay, on average, they're about a thousand times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, that sounds odd, okay, but it is. I mean, Compasses um, are affected by the Earth's magnetic field when there's nothing else to affect them nearby. 
Even if there's something else there, then that's going to take over. Yes, yeah, sunspot is about 10 times, produces about a magnetic field that's about 10 times stronger than that. An MRI, who's ever had an MRI? When you feel it, I had an MRI once on, on my knee. And I remember when I was, went into the place to get the MRI and they, they give you this big questionnaire, this big thing, like, have you ever had metal in your eye? And you're, like, all kinds of crazy questions. And it's like, first of all, you think, well, why are they asking me all this stuff? And it's, you start thinking about it, though. What kind of implications would that have if you've had little metal shards stuck in your eye? Well, it's probably not a good thing if you're putting a magnetic field strength of 15 Tesla. That's 10 to the positive 1 Tesla, right? 10 to the 1 Tesla. It's a million times the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. And let's say that you've got this little metal shard, this ferromagnetic, if it's copper, it doesn't matter, right? But if it's a steel, ba an iron-based thing like steel in your eye, and all of a sudden you're introducing a magnetic field of 15 Tesla, it, that might be an issue. Hey, that might be a problem. It's not going to rip your eye out, but it might rip the shard of metal out right out of your eye and, and damage your eye. That's probably not a good thing. The strongest ever magnetic field made by human beings is still 10 to the 1. It's twice as strong as the MRI machine, but it's still in the same order of magnitude. So that gives you some perspective as to how strong an MRI magnet really is. This is what you want to stay away from. This magnetar, this magnetic neutron star, which has a magnetic field of 10 to the 11 Tesla. Um, if you ever find yourself way out in space, and I'm not sure how far you'd have to be to encounter one of these things, but probably light years away from Earth, if you ever find yourself out there, just you know, get lost sometime and you're out there. Um, and you look at the map and you see, oh, there's a magnetic neutron star over this way. Turn the other way. Stay away from the magnetic neutron star. Okay. It's probably strong enough. I don't know. It's probably strong enough, if you could even get that close, obviously. Probably literally to suck the iron right out of your blood. <laughs> Which, you know what, guys? The good news is, here's the good news. Long before, you'd be dead long before that ever happened. That's the good news. Before the uh, iron was ever sucked out of your blood, you'd be, you'd be a goner. Okay, quick comparison. Then I want to show you a picture of the Earth's magnetic field, and then we're done for the day. So we've got three fields now that we've talked about. This one in Physics 20. Okay, this one in our last unit, and this one now in our new unit. The source, okay, I think they're pretty obvious. The source of a gravitational field is a mass source of an electric field is a charge. I don't know why I wrote this. The source of a magnetic field is a ferromagnetic material with aligned domains. What's a simpler way to say that? A magnet. The source of a magnetic field is a magnet. A gravitational field is always attractive toward the producer. An electric field that can be attractive or repulsive, just like a magnetic field can be. An electric field is away from the positive toward the negative or the direction that a positive particle points when placed in the field. And a magnetic field is the direction that a compass points away from the north toward the south. For our last slide, I'm about to change everything you've ever believed in. Draw a picture of the Earth's magnetic field. Let me just, uh, let me not give it away too soon here. Let me draw a picture of the Earth here. Okay, the Earth, Canada's up here, right? And Antarctica is down here. Antarctica, I can't spell it. You know what it is? I can't write and talk at the same time. Antarctica, there we are, Antarctica. Okay, here's the equator right here, right? So far so good? The magnetic field that surrounds the Earth is going to look something like this. It looks remarkably like the magnetic field surrounding a bar magnet. Okay? We don't have this massive bar magnet inside the Earth, but it's as if we do. The magnetic field inside the Earth, by the way, is caused, Jackson, by a churning magma, churning molten magma with iron floating around it inside, inside the Earth. But it produces a magnetic field that's remarkably like a bar magnet. 
So it looks like this. What about the direction? Well, let's say I'm standing right here at the equator with a compass. Which way does the compass point? Toward Canada, Canada or Antarctica? To points towards Canada, right? right? Points towards northern Canada. So the compass needle points this way. Okay, that means the magnetic field is pointing towards Canada. But take a step back for a second. How did we define the direction of magnetic field? A, the direction that a compass needle points when placed in the field. Okay, check. B, from north to south. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the Earth's magnetic field is actually not the way we think of it. Okay, the Earth's magnetic field is reversed. The Earth's magnetic field is such that the North Pole is down here in Antarctica and the South Pole is in Canada. Geographically, that's not the way it is at all. Geographically, northern Canada is the north. But magnetically, technically, we're closer to the South Pole than we are the North Pole. It doesn't change a thing. It doesn't change a thing. Compasses still point towards northern Canada, except that they're not pointing towards the north. They're pointing towards the south. In the end, if we all call it the north, if we all have the same frame of reference, it doesn't really matter. Okay, we could call it Bob if we wanted to, instead of north or instead of south, as long as we're all calling it the same thing. Right? When we're navigating, even though it's not technically north, we call it north, and that's okay, as long as we're all calling it the same thing. So, what we're telling you is this, guys. Santa Claus doesn't live in the North Pole. Santa Claus lives in the South Pole. And the penguins don't live in the South Pole. Oops. Messed that up. The penguins live in the North Pole. So, if there's one thing you can take away from this lesson today, It's the reason for the last 18 years you've never been able to find Santa. You've been looking in the wrong place. He doesn't live in the North Pole, he lives in the South Pole.